first meeting. This court can be considered only as a third aid. We cannot pause in the time that we have <coughs> to examine very many details, but merely to suggest time for further research and to assist the individual wishing to make a serious study of various parts of the Bible or of the whole work, according to the conditions and inclinations. This evening we're going to get a little from the previous outline because we are going to examine certain sections from the first book of Kings in more detail. Particularly in those parts that relate to the building of Solomon's Temple. If we intend to use this material, consider it important enough for discussion, we should try to give it as much orientation as we can in terms of the conditions under which it is compiled and the opinions and findings of those who are most directly associated with the production of this of the work or with the language and the philosophy which it unfolds. The principal sources of Old Testament historical orientation are the books themselves and the writings of the historian Josephus. was a man apparently of thorough mind and with a considerable scholarship. His historical records, so far as we have been able to verify them historically through time, have been essentially correct. And he seems to have had the capacity to organize his history in a meaningful sequence. With his emphasis upon the significance of events, rather than merely the chronicling of the occurrences themselves. He was much of the same spirit as distinguished H.G. Wells, the modern historian, who pointed out that the real purpose of his faith is to record the internal growth of man, and not the passing adventures of empire. Josephus, with this mind and with this thinking, has given us some valuable information. Another possible and useful source of Old Testament tradition consists of the commentaries and the legends and the lore, some parts of these being actually earlier than the written words themselves. We know that the entire thinking of Israel was not locked in the Pentateuch. These people had minds and thoughts and that they were a living people, and therefore that they had a literature, they had a culture, and it created art. They were advanced in many departments of human knowledge and aesthetic appreciation. So we are not surprised that they have left us a rich heritage of contemporary thought and also a considerable amount of later material bearing upon it. It's not possible in the time that we have to attempt to give you a full list of representations of authority. So, I think for those parts which are not actually canonical, you can say, use a well-known phrase, that these parts are of the mind of Israel, that they represent its thinking, its feelings, its beliefs. And as the old words themselves sometimes begin with the words, thus it is reported by our fathers. This is the approach to a subject where naturally most historical landmarks are inadequate. The historical phase of the subject by no means exhaustive, and that point is one which we hope to develop a little later in the evening. For the moment, however, let us analyze the story as it is contained in the first eleven chapters of the book of the first book of Kings. When David was called 
his father according to the will of the Lord. Solomon his son became king of Israel. Solomon was in Solomon was at that time twelve years of age. And his name was not Solomon. His name was given to him much later. His name was Jedediah, which means the friend of God. He was the son of David and Bathsheba. And he inherited a while with Israel. Not only the glory of David, but the burden of David. And we find frequently referred to in these early writings. The sins of David, and how these descended upon Solomon. And the sins of Solomon, and how these descended upon Israel. But for our present moment, we are concerned with a young man who inherited a strange and peculiar task appointed to him not only by David his father, but by Samuel the prophet, the great teacher of Israel, the man who dared uh, to reprimand David before the court of Israel. David has been likened uh, to the character of King Arthur in the legendary and lore of Britain. During David's lifetime, the people of Israel were in almost constant warfare. It was the work of David to consolidate him, the great country which was gradually coming into social and political existence. For well, the reign of David was a reign of war, but of tribulation and of burden. There was civil peace in Israel, and therefore the great purpose and dream of David's life was not fulfilled. For well, he had dreamed and hoped and prayed that it might be to him given, that he might build the everlasting house of the eternal God in Israel. But this, according to the ancient prophets, the God of Israel did not thank him, but left it to his son to carry on this work of him. And one of the reasons, according to the ancient scholars, why this necessary was, that while David was king of Israel, he built himself a house which took 15 years to build. But he did not have time to build the house of the Lord. The Lord was offended. Solomon, who followed after, was a rich and powerful king. But according to the commentary, he was favored before David because he resolved first to build the house of the Lord. And after that, to build all other things that were necessary. And in his early life, Solomon stood upon the plain of Gideon. And while he was upon that plain, he prayed over the Lord of hosts. And the God of Israel appeared to him, and spoke to him, and said that of all those who were to come, only next to the Messiah should be the glory of Solomon. And that because of this glory, he was privileged to ask of the Lord any favor, any gift, any boon that he might desire. And Solomon, because even as a lad, he was exceeding in wisdom and understanding, was quiet for a moment, and then he answered the Lord and said to him, Great God of Israel, I ask only one thing, that thou could give me wisdom of understanding. Because if I have this, all other things that are necessary shall come from you. And God was pleased with the reply of Israel to the Solomon of Israel. And they bestowed upon Solomon the gift of wisdom. And it was this wisdom which was afterwards to distinguish his life. But because of certain things which he did were against the Lord, certain parts of his wisdom were later taken from him. It remained to the end a wise a good ruler over the people. Now Solomon, realizing that it was one of his first duty from his father, David, that he should build the everlasting house, first then resolved to form a partnership with a neighboring ruler with whom he was very friendly. And this was Hiram, king of Tyre. And Hiram was a very learned and wonderful man. And there are still in existence in the ancient Jewish writings copies of letters between Solomon and the king of Tyre. And these 
letters were sent to Blair from the level of philosophy. And we asked others, the others, strange questions that caught the answer. And we tried to be more complete and more perfect than the answer uh, than the other. But there was a real and great friendship between these two men. And so it was the Titan of Fire, the Lord Solomon, that he might have some share in the building of the temple. And Solomon was inclined to consider this. For the reason of why he had great wealth. He lacked certain raw materials and necessary things. And he also lacked skilled workmen. For the people of Israel were not skilled in architecture. So he sent to Hiram of Tyre and asked him to invoke the presence of the Ionian officers or builders, the great tribe of Gilm, Gilm, who had been concerned with the building of the great temple with the monuments of antiquity. And Hiram of Tyre received the son of Solomon, 3,300 overseers of men, and those who were trained in all arts and crafts so that all good things and beautiful things might be available for the completion of the everlasting world. And as the plans progressed, there were two thoughts in the mind of Solomon. One was derived from his father David. But David had told him that, my son, Israel is rich with the gold that has been taken from captive nations, and there's many precious and wonderful things which have been booty and loot from the army and for a military expedition. But it is not seemly that any of these would be used in the building of the everlasting house. For it would not be right or good before God. But these things which have been taken in strife should be used for the adoration of God. Therefore, they made a money song that he was used only such wealth, such means, as had come from the people themselves have been given freedom or have been gathered by regular means so that they could at no time be any stigma upon the traders of the house so that they would never be seen or thought of or believed or known as having been gained by violence or destruction. So Solomon was very careful of this and he was able to fulfill this fact of the great wealth that he gained through his own ingenuity and various means. One of his methods of attaining this wealth was through his pact with the king of Tyre. For Tyre uh, was a mercantile port. And Solomon equipped ships and engaged in trade and barter and exchange throughout the land of the Near East. And the men of Israel were not sailors, nor were they used to sea. So Hiram of Tyre supplied the Tyre Syrian navigators, and they shared the profits of these great expeditions has been in the many parts of the world. And from such sources as these, Solomon gained the traces necessary for the building of the everlasting house, and did not be forced to call upon any soil of battle for the ornamentation or the decoration of the house. The second thing that concerned him most deeply was of his own problem, for he desired to build his house in the place that the Lord of hope and the destiny, but he did not know where God wished him to build the temple. So again he entered into great prayer, and he went into fasting, and he meditated for many days, and he besought the Lord to show him the place upon which the house should stand. And the Lord of Israel came to him, and led him by the hand, and told him to go to a certain place upon Mount Zion. And he went, he went to this place upon Mount Zion, and he came to a little piece of land which was owned by two brothers. And this land was their threshing floor, where they brought their grain. Now these two brothers were very dear and near to each other, but were strangely different of their circumstances. One brother was a bachelor, and very poor, and he had no means of livelihood except his share of the grain, which was stretched upon the threshing floor and placed in two heaps equally, one half for each brother. His brother was a rich and powerful man and had a large family and many children. And uh, he uh, also uh, took his part of the grain largely because it was his by right. Now in the dark of the night, the Lord told Solomon to go to the threshing floor of the Jebusite and there in the silence of the night to wait and behold the wondrous workings of the Lord. 
So some of the women stood there in the shade of the tree where he could not be seen. And in the moonlight, he saw the poor artist's back to her mother go out of his house in silence and in quietude and without letting anyone know. And he went to his heap of grain and he took a large part of that heap of grain and he carried it over and sprinkled it upon his brother's pile. And he did it so carefully that it was not noticeable. Yet he had given away a large part of his grain. And he did this because he was a bachelor. And although he was poor, his brother had many children. And therefore, he felt that his brother needed more than an equal share. And Solomon watched and was deeply moved by this wonderful example of brotherly love. And he kept quiet and waited as the Lord had instructed him. And after this brother had departed, the other rich and, and wealthy and happy brother came. And he looked for a moment from the pile. Then he went to his own pile, and he took a large part of the grain off and put it upon the pile of his poor brother. And he did this because although he was rich and had many children, he did not want to offend his brother with charity. But he wanted his brother to have more than an equal share because his brother was poor and had no other way of making a living. And neither one or the other to know of the charity, lest it would offend them. And when Solomon the king saw this, he bowed his head in recognition to God and he said, Here, on the place which is the sign of kinship, of two unselfish brothers, each giving secretly of himself for the good of the other, I shall build the everlasting house. And thus it came that the Rosh Moriah was the ancient threshing lord of the Jebusite, where they had divided the grain in their coming rain to give each more than his proper share. And uh, when Solomon saw this, he realized that God had blessed his place, and he was waiting to the people that the blessing of God was present in the service of these two, and that was a proper and appropriate symbol of a sanctified path, a place set aside for the highest and the noblest of human commission. And so here Solomon built his everlasting house. Now the story of the building of Solomon's temple is very largely a description of the methods and means of the erection, the designing of it, the uh, departments into which it was divided, the size, and all the other circumstances. And we know that the Ionian workmen that were sent by Hiram mm -hmm. of Tyre labored long and diligently upon this house. And the masters of this group designed the wonderful fittings of all of us in the temple. And Solomon sent many workmen, <coughs> and jewelers of wood and carriers of water, to the cedars of Lebanon. And he cut down the great cedars that become the beams and spans of the everlasting earth. <coughs> these cedars of Lebanon were very wonderful trees. And they were taken to Joppa and Pope And there they were brought to Jerusalem and placed in the building. Now the ancient rabbin tell us, and of course in Israel, what they tell us must be true. That is the way the people feel about it. But after these cedars had been placed in the temple, they did not die, but because of the strange power of that peculiar wood, they grew after they had been put in place. And they burst forth into branches, and they turned green, and they were made alive and filled with life by the incense smoke arising from the altars of offerings. And these strange trees bore strange fruit which was none of their kind. And the young priests of the temple, in great tribulation of time and in famine, were fed by the fruit that grew from the pillars of Lebanon that were in the everlasting house. Now the temple of Solomon, according to the story, took seven years to build. And during these seven years, Many strange and wonderful things happened. During these years, not one workman sickened or died. During these years, not one instrument of the workman was dulled or broken or worn. During these seven years of the work, there was no discord among all these workmen. They labored together in peace, and happiness and tranquility was upon the place, and no one sickened and no one died during the building of the everlasting house. 
And when finally at the end of seven years the house was finished, Solomon was told by the Lord that he must not open the house upon that day, the day of the coming, but that he must wait because the dedication of the temple must occur in the month of the birth of Abraham. So nearly a year passed before the coming of the day of the great dedication of the temple. And when that day came, Solomon went toward the place of the Holy of Holies. And upon the doors of the Holy of Holies were the brazen figures of the cherubim, guarding forever the sacred place. And as Solomon approached the doors of the Holy of Holies, the doors closed in his face. And it was a strange and mysterious thing because the doors could not be opened. And in this time and on this occasion, Solomon knelt in prayer before the gates of the Holy of Holies. And he besought the Lord to open the gates, and they remained closed. And he prayed in many ways for the opening of these doors, but they were not open until the Lord whispered in his ear the thing that he would say. And Solomon raised his hand to the Lord, and he said, Lord, in this day of the great rejoicing, remember now the worthy work of thy son David, who came before the king of Israel. And as the word David, the door is open, and the great prophets and priests bowed their heads, because they knew that at that moment the divine will had forgiven the sins of David. So there are many and strange and wonderful stories about the story of the everlasting world. And in the completion of this work, which Solomon had begun according to the law of the father, there was a thing. Suddenly the work thing began to roll. And their tools broke, and they could not use them again. And many of them died. But the master of the work, a man of Tyre who had been brought by uh, Hiram to make all of the great instruments for the temple. A man by the name of Hiram, who was the son of a widow. According to the ancient writings, he and he alone, of all the workmen, was permitted to enter heaven without death. But he was taken up among those who did not die and placed with the Lord for a thousand years. And of the others, they scattered, but none of them ever built again, because they could not build another house after having built the home, say, a home or temple of the living God. And into the temple of Solomon were brought the wonderful and sacred objects, or the replicas of them, or new representations of them, which have been in the, tab in the tabernacle in the wilderness. And it was an ascendant, uh, it was a deep, uh, an ancestor of Hiram, the master builder, who had fashioned the furniture of the tabernacle. So that this particular and wonderful task descended to this family. And having completed the temple according to the will of heaven, and the king having kept promise he made to David, Solomon then built his own throne, the magnificent throne of lions. And he built a home for his queen who was the daughter of the very old Egypt. And he built many wonderful buildings, and a scientific building, and colleges and schools for the instruction of his people. And after he had completed this tremendous project, a uh, mysterious visit came from Balkan, the Queen of Saba, whom we call the Queen of Sheba. From Balkan to Saba, was the wisest woman in the world. And she had heard of the wisdom of Solomon. So she came to test the wisdom of Solomon. And there are many wonderful and interesting stories of the, of the wonderful program that these two devised to investigate the mysteries of the universe out of time and of eternity and of all strange things. There is a very simple and interesting little legend that comes from that time, which is amusing. Each tested the other. Balkis tested Solomon, and Solomon tested Balkis, concerning their ability to judge and decide and determine the truth of things. And on one occasion, the Queen of Saba brought into the presence of Solomon two magnificent baskets of 
flower. So identical with no human being to tell them apart. And so perfect that no way could be told, no way could be seen to distinguish them. And the clean pole solitude may not touch you, you may only look upon them. And you shall tell me which of these baskets is filled with living flowers and which with imitations. The king was silent for some time because it was a rather tricky question. And then he told the, one of his courtiers, he said, open the windows of the palace. And they opened the windows of the palace and these came in. And these immediately went to the living flower. He could not see the bees. And thus it was that Solomon was able to solve the riddle of health. So there are many such wonderful and strange accounts This book shows with all the light in the world 
and lighted heaven the more the sun and moon were passing. It had never been seen. There was no dedication ever given to it. It's simply called the book. And this book was with God in the beginning. For it was the book that was peculiarly associated with the power of God. And at the time before the fall in the ancient legend, so when Adam attended the University of the Angels in heaven, the angel Raphael brought down to Adam from God the book and placed it before him and said to him, Here is the book of the knowing of all things that may be known. And here is the book by which the name of the substance of things may be discovered. Even the name of the part of things. Even the name of the meaning of things. Even the name of heaven itself. The unutterable, mysterious, unpronounceable name. Which is the root of all things. And this book was left with Adam for a time. By the angel of Brazil. But according to the old legend. The celestial beings who watched over Eden. Became envious. The power of the book. Because it contained all things. And one said to the other, If Adam has this book and reads it all, he will know all the mysteries of the universe. And this must not be. So they took the book away from him. And they passed it to the sea. It had to be made. And Adam went forth alone into the wilderness to search for the book. And while he was there, he prayed and fasted. The Spirit of God came to him. And Adam told how the book had been taken away. The Spirit of the Lord spoke and called upon Rahab, who was the angel of the city, and told him to restore the book. The book was prepared. And when Adam died, the book was given to Shem. By Shem it was kept for the generations which were to come. And after the time, the book disappeared. No one could find it. And while this book was very strangely and mysteriously missing, the God of Israel sent a good man on the earth, a man upon whom the gifts of God of God is prophecy and of knowing all things which is stolen for the will of heaven. The name of this good man was Enoch. And Enoch walked with the Lord, and the Lord spoke to him. The Lord appeared to him in a dream and told him to go to a certain cave. And if he would go into this cave down under the earth, he would find there the mysterious book of God written upon the tablets of sapphire. And Nina found the book as he had been instructed. And from this he wrote the mysterious book of Nina, in which he revealed the mysteries of heaven and earth. Now a great time was to pass before the story of this book was completed. And it came about the Lord according to Israel. Having discovered that the children of his creation had disobeyed him, resolved to send a deluge and a flood upon the earth. And he therefore called unto his beloved son Noah and told him to prepare against the tribulation of the earth. And when he was so instructed, the Lord sent the book of jewels, the mysterious book of books. And he placed it in the hands of Noah, and the messenger of the Lord on this occasion was the archangel of Arachia. And this book was placed in the keeping of Noah. And Noah was permitted to open certain pages of it, and then he to discover the from those pages all the mysterious calculations necessary for the formation of the ark. And he followed the instructions which were in the book. And when the water came, Noah made a task of his bones placed it around the book. And he placed the book in the ark. And for forty days and forty nights there was darkness upon the face of the deep. And there was no sun, no moon, nor stars, and all was strangely obscure. But this mysterious book lighted the way of Noah. And in this book it shone as gold in the daytime, and as silver at night. And therefore Noah was able to know the number of the days and the number of the nights. We were able to know all things happening in the universe, although they were invisible because of the great oblivion of the deep. And 
then the law of the book passed past to Abraham and the gate of the wife. And the wall of the great king got the book finally and came into the hands of Solomon, the king of Israel. Now this Solomon, if we are to go a little bit afar into the legend of the Arabian Nights of all these things, was a man who had very strange knowledge from the war. And he also had a knowledge of things belonging to other worlds. And he was able to make strange and mysterious things. And not only did the Lord give Solomon kingship over all the human beings, but he made him also king of the beast. So that all the animals obeyed the law of the Lord. Solomon had an eagle which carried him about. And he had money, many mysterious and wonderful inventions to enable him to fly past through the air to perform wonders and miracles. And many of the traces of these legends are found in the Arabic language. If you will notice by the Catholic study of the complete and unabridged tradition of the Arabian Nights and the Kingdom. And this mysterious book was buried by Solomon and was hidden away so that the world might not find it. But the old ones, the elders, maintain that from the beginning of the world there had been not only the Torah, which was the revealed law, but there had been a hidden law, which was truly the secret doctrine of Israel. And that this hidden law was the key to the law and the prophets. And that only by the turning of this key seven times in the great law could the mysteries of the Shekinah's glory and the Makkah of the law be made known. In the, one of the earliest examples of this conception or this belief is in connection with the Proverbs of Solomon. For the ancient rabbinical writers calculated these Proverbs as three times the number of the editions that they published. The answer being that each one contained two others, and that each Proverb was therefore three complete words if the individual knew how to interpret it. The mysticism of Israel and uh, the contemporary records of it are mostly in the nation. Although the of the world very closely with the final surviving manuscripts of the Old Testament. We may assume that the situation did not originate at that time, but that mm -hmm. all the foundations and footings of these things are of much greater antiquity. Legends going back 12 or 1500 years before the beginning of the Christian era certainly contain intimations like that of the mysterious Book of the Law. The intimation is that these people held it to be definitely and inalienably true that they did possess a key or a secret answer or a secret solution to the mysteries of their life. Uh, this thought is certainly preserved even today in Christendom in the uh, insignia and press of the folks of Rome. The uh, papal press, of course, is the papal tiara surmounting the cross. One of these keys is silver, and the other key is gold. And it has been the mind of the church, in fact, the actual key of the church for a great many centuries. But the silver key represented the key which unlocked the Kabbalah of the Old Testament. And the golden key, the key which unlocked the Kabbalah of the New Testament. Uh, this statement, and all one identical in meaning with it without equivocation, is to be found in the early religious writings of the church. They assume and accept that without any reasonable message. So in the Jewish tradition, the silver key of the Kabbalah plays quite an important part in the descent of this tradition. <coughs> As I mentioned to you before, there was a report that Moses ascended Sinai three times. The first time for 40 days, the first time the Torah was given. The second time for 40 days, when the Mishnah was given. And the third time before the day, so the Kabbalah was given. But Moses was forbidden to place the Kabbalah in writing. 
Therefore, for many centuries, it was perpetuated only by the high priest. Only one at a time was supposed to possess each the mysterious key that unlocked all of the scriptures, all of the allegories, all of the symbols of the entire religious system. Uh, we are kind of confronted with the same problem in certain of the Brahmatic uh, priests of India. Among them, certain ones carry a key as the symbol of their authority. The Egyptian pharaoh, as ruler of the mysteries, carried the key around his neck in state ceremony. This key was the Koi Santata, which opens back to us. But the key as a part of the symbolism is very old and very rich. The decline of uh, Jewish culture, uh, resulting in and resulting from, to a certain degree, uh, the domination by the Roman Empire. It resulted gradually in the disintegration of the internal structure of Judaism. Uh, it it, it operated in a collective pattern and became more and more completely a problem of survival in the individual believer. The individual believer took his faith with him wherever he went. He worshipped alone, he believed alone, he meditated alone. And to a great degree, the Christianism resulted in a tremendous frustration and a tremendous pressure uh, that affected his spirit. Those of you who years ago were then in Jerusalem before the liberation of Israel. And the first of lamentations into the wall at the wall of Herod's temple will appreciate the cry of Israel that rose the twenty five centuries. And this cry of Israel uh, was strangely associated with the rise of a very positive mysticism within the people. They turned more and more within themselves in search of truth, in search of salvation, consolation of spirit, security in life. So we are not surprised that as the early Roman persecution began to affect Israel, that the mystical dimensions of their doctrine were uh, revived. And probably one of the greatest uh, leaders in this revival was the Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva, who buried about the beginning of this year, quite earlier, and restored or gathered all of the great legends, all of the great law, all of the fading memories of his people, to restore as far as he could their concept of life. And he is accredited with having created a work called the Sefer Yitzvira, or the Book of the Beginnings. This does not constitute an historical work. The Sefer Yitzvira is actually the story of Jewish philosophy. It is the story of the concept of creation and of the organization and generation of worlds which underlies the Mosaic theory. And uh, Rabbi Akiva also was one of the first to introduce a complete system of philosophy among his people, dependent entirely upon letters and numerical equivalents. He therefore suddenly gave to the ancient works a, a new and powerful interpretation. He admonished against the changing of the spelling of names and things of that time, and that admonition which again occurred in the book of Revelation. And he warned these days people that even the sounds of the sacred words were valuable and important and meaningful. But particularly, he developed a system of philosophy by creating analogies between the letters of the Hebraic alphabet and the elements, dimensions, directions, powers, and forces of nature. He was able, therefore, to use letters to spell out living things. And there are many legends about Rabbi Akiva, uh, some of which... Uh, are no doubt apocryphal, and others are no doubt efforts to symbolize his meaning or explain the thing that he himself was trying to explain. For example, uh, Rabbi Akiva uh, could take letters. For instance, he could take the letters of the word for a dove, and he took the letters and he fashioned them completely and put them together in a magical way, and they came to life and threw away like the dove. Because everything that the Rabbi Akiva did with letters became that thing. 
when I, when I keep on made a house out of letters, the house was there. When Rabbi Akiva made a bird, spelled the name of the bird and breathed upon it, the bird flew. Because he fastened the letters, not in the traditional way, but in a magical way. So that every letter formed a line, and every line contributed to a certain pattern. And when the pattern was perfect, it was no longer a symbol, it was only a thing itself, and it came to life. So the Rabbi Akiva to take the words of the Bible, the words of Scripture, and they came to life. He could take the name of God, and it came to life, and became a radiant, living, and eternal thing. And everything that I see that fashioned out of numbers or letters became immortal and lived forever. And the very strange series of legends. There are certain indications that this parallel uh, may have been partly due to the earlier experiences during the fifth and sixth centuries in which Jewish scholars became acquainted with the early development of Greek mathematics. We know that between the third and sixth centuries, Greek scholars have visited Jerusalem and also the Jewish scholars visited Athens and became associated with the philosophical systems there. And there is much in the thinking of Akiva that indicates the deadness of Pythagoras. On one occasion, Pythagoras told his disciples, for example, uh, that his own name was a Kabbalah, and that anyone who could solve the mystery of the name Pythagoras alone could solve the mystery of the universe, because that was not his real name. And so it was with Akiva. Akiva would let no man know his name. Because he said the man who knew his name could control him forever. Because every man has a secret name. And if that name comes into the power of another, that control passes with it. Now out of these thinkings, we then perceive the rising of what might be termed a transcendental magic. We see the Jewish mind under the frustration and pressure of great affliction, becoming almost violently mystical. We see speculations extending uh, far beyond what might be uh, immediately considered reasonable. And because of this, there was a great revulsion in the Sanhedrin. There was a great division among the people. And in this particular situation, there is one point that I think that may need a little clarification. And due to the relevant use of the New Testament, a uh, great many persons have come to rather mistaken ideas about the Pharisees among the Jews. Uh, we think now of the scribes and Pharisees as being a more or less uh, arrogant, uh, opinionated group of people. Well, they may have been or they may not have been, I don't know. But uh, actually, some of the people and some other reputable historians we find that most of the mysticism of Israel descended through the Pharisees. In other words, the Pharisees were the fact at that time of <coughs> the Incarnation and the only one of The Pharisees were the ones who were then looking for a Messiah. The Pharisees were the ones who would have become scholars and students in these subjects, and also were the ones who had had contact with the Greeks and other people and we're bringing in a great many innovations into the life of the Jewish people. The Pharisees were also uh, toying with a great deal of philosophy derived from contact with the Jews, because in the Solomonic cycle, we get very definitely that King Solomon received gifts and uh, various tokens of esteem from the kings of, of High Asia, and that many of the decorations used in the temple were based upon the decorations which were sent as gifts from India. Solomon was definitely known historically to have been in contact with the Far East. And this is not um, um, amazing when we realize that Paulus of the Aksaba, the queen, came to what is now Yemen, which is on the, just almost on the boundaries of Afghanistan and only across the passage from what we now call Indian and Pakistan. So the um, Mysticism of that time was beginning to take rather broad proportion. About the time of Akiva, shortly later, another man arose who we have also mentioned to you, but we'll have to come back to him for a moment because he plays a part in things. And that was Rabbi Simeon Ben Yochoi. Rabbi Simeon 
is also a very elusive person. He is of about the same density as most of those involved in the Adept tradition. He is very difficult to isolate historically, and nearly all that we know about him, as is the case in also in so many scriptural accounts, is what he said about himself. Apparently during the reign of Vespasian, uh, Rabbi Simeon ben Yochai was persecuted because he preached the rights of the Jewish people to the perpetuation of their religion and philosophy. He uh, was accused of sedition, of <coughs> endangering the Jews, and a price was placed upon his head. To escape his enemies, Rabbi Simeon went into the desert, and there he found a cave, and with a small group of faithful followers, he remained in this cave for the entire duration of the reign of that station. They had no clothing, and when they were cold, they had to cover their bodies with earth. They had only the poorest of food, and very little uh, power or means of securing anything, because they did not dare to reveal their presence. A few faithful persons brought them then, but according to the story itself, the Lord said that, even as he had fed the children with manna in the wilderness. And then he remained for so many years in prayer and meditation and holy life and in austerity in the cave. Rabbi Simeon ben Yochai had lived so great and pious and wonderful life that the living God brought to him or permitted him to look upon the mysterious book of the Sapphire Tablets. And the book which had been hidden from the destruction of the temple, the book that was not found in the second temple, and was not known to exist during the diaspora, was revealed in all its shining glory to Rabbi Simeon in the cave. Now it's possible that the story, uh, even though we may regard it as apocryphal, had a, a part to play in the rise of Islam. Because the story parallels almost exactly the story of the illumination of Muhammad. As you remember Mohammed, uh, a merchant of Mecca, a good man, pious who was horrified because of his own internal integrity by the degradation of the city in which he lived. Mecca was a sacred city, belonging to an old, old faith, the faith of the state of Savior and Sires. But it had declined and decayed until it was nothing but a place of merchants and thieves to rob children who came there and bathed and beneath. And the soul of Muhammad was offended. And he prayed that some way might be found for him to cleanse Mecca. And Muhammad, as a man, never had any ambitions outside or beyond Arabia. And his principal ambition was the cleansing and the purification of his own city. At that time he was married to a very good and wonderful woman, Kedijah who had much his elder, and who married him because he had made such a success of keeping her accounts and guarding her caravan groups. And Muhammad explained to the injury of the soul of the caravan, and she told him the only thing for him to do was take it in prayer and receive within himself the answer. And Muhammad did this very thing. And in the course of his prayers, he went away into the mountains, and he found the mountain who were a cave in it. Into this cave he went, and the mountain was called Judah, yeah. his honor, which means the mountain of the light. And here, in prayer and meditation, fasting, and self-abnegation, Muhammad asked that the primitive and original religion of mankind, pure as it had been in the days of the patriarchs and the prophets, might be again revealed to the world. And at that time, the angel, uh, Raziel, or as some say, uh, the angel Gaboriel, Gabriel, appeared to him and showed him the writings or surahs of the Koran about a shawl of milk. Now in the case of Simeon ben Yochai, in this case, the uh, mysterious words were shown on upon this living stone, this strange, keen, and uh, glittering sapphire seemed to be alive as though there was constant fire within itself. And in this fire the letters stood out. And in his mysteries and in his characters, Rabbi Simeon compiled the books of the greater and the lesser holy assemblies, and the books of the lesser and the greater faiths, 
and all the strange commentaries and uh, uh, allusions that go together to make the Sefer Hazoha the book of the splendors of the Lord. Now the fate of this book is very mysterious because like the original tablets of Sapphire it disappeared. This appeared so completely that most rabbinical scholars today declare that neither the book nor the supposed author ever existed. That this entire story is a legend and a fable. And that actually the Sephardah Zohar was compiled much later during the period of the uh, Jewish Renaissance in Spain by one Rabbi Samir, uh, Rabbi Moses of Leon. The study of the book, however, in its intrinsic structure, makes such a statement highly impossible. I think we are far more likely to be faced with this situation. Namely, that the books of Simeon ben Yochai, like for that matter the Pentateuch and the entire Old Testament, were carried for centuries in the minds of certain persons. But due to the destruction of the books, as you must remember that in those days books were not numerous as they are now, one Jewish scholar figured that at the time of Solomon, there were probably not more than from 20 to 30 topics for Pentateuch. This would make the book highly vulnerable to destruction. The burning of cities, the recapturing of people, the looting and destruction, the looting and destruction of their sacred belongings could very well make this book inaccessible, if not entirely extinct. Uh, in fact, still remains that there is no copy of the Jewish manuscript of the Old Testament earlier than the 9th century AD. And that means that in all probability, most of the older manuscripts did perish because of the small number of them that existed. <clears throat> As the Roman conquest and the persecution of that Isinio is studied in this light, it is very possible that most of the Sefa Azora, which is the great description of the Kabbalah, did not descend through 12 or 1300 years in written form. Or is in written form at all in only one or two carefully guided God in the Sarah's manuscript. Perhaps like those manuscripts uh, that are supposed to have fallen into the keeping of Nostradamus from his ancestors as a result of their carrying these books around with them from the time of the diaspora to the final settlement in Nevada. So the fact most likely is the Rabbi Moses of Leon either came into the possession of a very ancient manuscript, or else that he was able to gather together from the wise, from the Hashemites, from the learned ones and the scholars, this wreck and this story, and painstakingly prepared it for ultimate publication. This publication did come uh, best known to us in the Latin version. Uh, which was published by Baron Knorr von Brodenroth, out of which we have the first edition in our library. This the descent of the Sephardah Zohar ties very closely with the concept of the old records and how they were protected and how they came down to it out of the miseries and mysteries of the past. Now to consider then the three books which, according to the Catholics, are the most important in, in the uh, development of their literature. They call these the Sefer Yetzira, or the Book of the Formation, the beginning, the origin of the thing, particularly containing the mystery of the public experimental. Not expect to have been included. 
And that is what they call the Sefer Apocalypse, or what we call the Book of Revelation. These three, then, they consider to be the primary years relating to the secret doctrine as it is preserved in the Bible. Though the actual doctrine of the Kabbalah become interesting to us on a number of grounds. In the first place, uh, we are concerned with the origin of such doctrine. We are also concerned with their orientation in world thought. We are concerned with the methods and probable authenticity of their perpetuation. And we are also concerned, to a certain degree at least, with the possibility of their contributing further knowledge or enlightenment or assisting in the correction or emendation of material relating to the biblical time or to the various books of the Bible. We know that these writings originated with the same people and at the same time, and therefore that they have a basic utility and it should be given at least some consideration. The Kabbalah primarily divides into about five or six parts. We think of it as a single tradition. According to the oldest form, the Kabbalah consisted of two original divisions. Uh, the five books of the Pentateuch, or of the Law, are uh, fall too short of being the complete septenary. Now, as I've also mentioned, uh, the sixth and seventh books of Moses, as they are now available or supposedly under distribution, are actually only grimoires. That is, they are productions of magic originating in the Middle Ages. They are not actually genuine productions of Moses or of the period in which Moses lived. The same is true of the Keys of Solomon, a work of magic lenders, which is comparatively late and belongs to such works as the grimoires of Pepe Honorius or the uh, religious uh, writings in magic. The sixth and seventh books of Moses, according to the old tradition, were the two works which completed the Torah or the Pentateuch or completed the law. Now the five books corresponded in the Mosaic belief to the first five days of creation. The sixth book was the sixth day, and the seventh book was the Sabbath. Now, the sixth book, according to the priesthood, was the Mishnah. The Mishnah having to do primarily with what might be termed Greek psychology, in the sense of being a study of man, the study of the internal working of man as a moral, ethical, spiritual, and material being. The mission, therefore, was the, the book uh, which was beneath the vestment, as Maimonides says. The body is the man wears a coat, which is the Torah. Beneath the coat is his body, which is the Mishnah, and within the body is the living soul, which is the cloud. So the Mishnah corresponds with the sixth book, which is the body of man. And it is a transference of legality, of the law, from the level of jurisprudence to the level of biology. It is the motion of the laws governing the universe, from the stone tablets to the living constitution of the human being. Therefore, the Mishnah is the law in life, or the living law, rather than the law of the tables of stone. The Mishnah corresponding, consequently, to the sixth day, according to the old painting, left the seventh day, which was the great Sabbath. Now, the Sabbath was the day of the silence. The Sabbath was represented by the center, around which gathered the directions. In these cases, and under this symbolism, the six faces of the cube. And in the center was the rest, or the point of the root now. And this great rest was, according to the doctrine of Israel, 
the spiritual experience of the Kabbalah. For the Kabbalah was that which gathered all the directions again into the center, which passed from the center all to the directions, creating a tremendous mystery of emotion in two directions at once, a motion by which all emptiness was filled and all fullness was empty. A motion in which all things move to that whole temple and at the same time move to that center. And this center was the great quiet, the eternal peace, for it turned upon the axis of the Shekinah glory. Thus in the Kabbalah was the great peace, which was the Jubilee. In the same way, the Kabbalah became the symbol of the Messiah, which was the rest and the peace of all nations. By the same token, uh, the Kabbalah became the symbol of the New Jerusalem, of the city which is to come, the city of the, of the perfect fulfillment of the prophecies, the golden age, which is to bring with it the end of all strife the mending of all ills, the overcoming of all doubt, and the world governed and ruled uh, by the living presence of God who is appointed and anointed ministers. So the Kabbalah represented all these things, but most of all it represented the great rest or the silence, the center. As one of the early writers called it, it was the great equilibrium. Because of this statement that is contained in the Sephah Zohar. Uh, unbalanced forces perish in the void, thus cast the kings of Edom and the giants of ancient days. So the Kabbalah was to Israel the great balance. It was a symbol of nothing too much nor too little. The perfect peace that fulfilled the law. For upon the seventh day the Lord rested. And on the Sabbath day, therefore, he set apart for the rest of men. And in Israel there can be no rest until the history of Israel is fulfilled. Therefore the great rest is the restoration of Israel, by which was arcanely intimated the fulfillment of all things necessary for the eternal good of man and the universe. The science of the Kabbalah then descended to the people from this concept of the great rest or the great peace. And there is much to indicate that there was an association here with some of the yogic teachings of the East. And that on a level of practical ritualism, ceremonialism, the magic of transcendental art, it is so called great rest of meditation, the cultivation of the internal discipline of peace, uh, the individual becoming receptive, uh, becoming accepting of the law. Entering into the quiet in which the God of Israel, or his voice, might be heard. Thus, the Kabbalah was also the saint of Saint Paul. It was the Holy of Holies, the place where the architect received the mysterious tracings upon his special board from the finger of the living God. So, to enter into the closet was used in ancient Israel to symbolize to enter into the Kabbalah. And those who entered into the closet and worshipped in secret, their God shall reward them openly. So the closet or the locked place, the its place, with both the heart and the doctrine. And by the strange and mysterious use of words, similar but not identical, it was possible to imply these very things by errors and by curiosities of spelling and structure. And I keep our left to be, by means of which these could be in an orderly and regular manner not haphazardly, not to please us at one moment and to be neglected another if it does not be, but invariably and inevitably to reveal the same machinery in the structure of the sentences, the words, and the numbers. The Kabbalah contains much more, however, than this approach, because we learn, for example, that Solomon, the king of Israel, was a great physician. We know less about this in the Jewish tradition and much more about it than the Arabic. But there are references to the mysterious power of healing which Solomon had from the Lord. And we, there is probable, probability that it is from Solomon 
not understanding the concept or the belief of touching for two people as a great attraction to you, where we believe uh, that anyone who was touched by the king was cured of suffering. The touching of King Rebo continued on down to the 18th century and is still found in some Eastern countries. But the belief that the anointed of the Lord, the king, had certain powers as priest and physician certainly is to be found among the early records. So we are not surprised to find that the Kabbalah, at a very remote time, began the study of the human body. At that time, very little was known about the human body in the West, with the possible exception of Egypt. Now, where dissection was permitted, it was not permitted in Greece. Therefore, it is probable that certain rudiments of knowledge concerning man uh, was derived during the uh, Egyptian and Babylonian captivities. But in the Kabbalah, we begin to see the development of a theory which was to dominate Europe for 1,500 years. And that was the great theory of the interchange of the microcosm and the microcosm. We find this beginning to appear in written form, as early as the Babylonian cuneiform, because there are tablets in the British Museum now in which the great phonetic axiom of as above and so below will be found attributed to the god Baal, or as some kind of model. And this concept of the interchange between superiors and inferiors, this concept that the universe is the great person, and the person is the little universe. It was already well advanced by the time the Jewish mystics took over the idea, but they did a great deal with it. For example, I have seen old Jewish manuscripts in Europe, in which there are four or five hundred diagrams of nothing but the human heart alone, and not one of them anatomical, every one of them magical, astronomical, mathematical, even going into music and showing the different tones of the blowing of the sofa and its, uh, and its effects upon the nerves and muscles of the heart structure. The effect of the hundreds and hundreds of different prayers estimated in the post -grade. All of these things were perhaps the principal interest and activity of these people for a long time because they were locked within themselves. They could not go out and mingle with other nations. They could not do the things that others did. And so we see them unfolding what they call the 21 powers of the sun through the human mind. We see them opening the 21 doors of the heart. We see them examining the flames of the powers therein. We find them examining the pulse point. We find them placing the solar system and the universe and the cosmic solar system all in the heart. And then in these diagrams we find the heart suddenly exploding into space to become the whole universe. And everything that relates to life is taking place within the great heart. These were their meditations and their speculations. And we might say that these are the foundation of what some have called the scientific cosmology. The scientific cosmology is related to such problems as the discovery of the heart and the brain. The discovery of the brain and the heart. The discovery of the stomach in the liver, the discovery of the kidneys in the brain, the discovery of all parts in all parts. And uh, we know now from the uh, notebooks, records, diaries of Leonardo da Vinci that he was concerned with this problem also, and that he had already received a considerable amount, considerable amount of lore about it as the result of the very liberal policies of uh, Lorenzo de Mestre. We allow a great number of Jewish scholars to become concerned with the great restoration of the Italian of Florence. But the speculation relating to these things, uh, relating to blood, relating to generation, relating to the methods and means by which propagation takes place, not visible but invisible. The great problem of magnetic fields, uh, the problem of the internal life of the individual, the ideas mysterious vestments, vestments uh, which are similar to those of the priests of Israel, vestured in the glory of the Lord, upon whose robes were the tassels and bells, upon whose garments were the pomegranates. He wore an evil, and also the body of righteousness, and the great breastplate containing the jewels of the twelve tribes of Israel. And in this type of the Kabbalah, we see man being explored. 
you see how the infant is repetition of the parts of man in the pores of his skin, in his muscle, in his nerve. So that the entire problem is infinite repetition, uh, uh, continuation or reproduction of the relationships of microcosm and macrocosm. How each little part contains all the rest. And how each great part is contained within a still greater whole. Thus, the practical phases of the Papala went into medicine. They went into algebra. And we find them highly developed. I've seen old Jewish prints showing the alchemical furnace as the human body, with all of the various alchemical processes taking place within it. These men were strangely learning in their own way. And they were working from a distinct and definite fact. They were not simply created as they went. They were unfolded in one manner, perpetually and through everything that they did. Now the next and perhaps one of the most interesting phases of the Kabbalah was the Kabbal of State. Uh, this was the unfoldment of the implications of the Torah and the commentaries relating the government of nations. And in this phase of the Kabbalah, we see the human body again as empire. We see the empire as a human body. We see the body and the empire as both of them, symbolical projection of principles, or sephira, or the great, eternal, unchangeable archetype of jewels that lie at the root of every manifestation. And in the Kabbalah we learn, for example, much of the concept of archetypes. We learn, for example, that in the death development of this doctrine, there is what is called reflection, not emanation. The Gnostics were the great emanationists. The Kabbalists were not primarily emanationists. They were reflectionists. In other words, to them, all things are reflections of their own superior. Everything captures and holds the rays of the universe. Everything, therefore, like a photographic lens, contains a picture of everything else. And every energy bears not only its light print, but its purpose print, which it bestows upon the things uh, which it illumines or vitalizes. So in the uh, Kabbalah, we have the motion downward along what are called in the old writings the steps of Solomon's throne. Now in the uh, old writing, we have the description of this throne. And we learned that it was a magnificent instrument that composed of many parts and itself a microcosm of the universe with one difference that instead of these parts really being gold and silver figures, every creature upon the throne was alive. It was a living thing. And this throne, therefore, was a great symbol of the living universe itself. But the development of the concept of Kabbalah followed the steps and platforms of Solomon's throne. And on these steps and platforms, we see the symbolism unfolding. And in the Kabbalah of faith, we see the great concept represented on one level in the heart of man, bursting forth into the concept of world government. We find it all unfolding in terms of a magnificent pattern or plan, the natural development of the Torah. So the books of Moses become not only the legislative code of Israel, uh, but they become the skeleton of a living body of the world, in which not only do we have the law and the prophets, but we also have the development of a great political psychology. These people believe that one of the great duties of man is to bring his own government into complete harmony with the government of the universe. And this they attempted to do, at least in secret, uh, through their teaching. We must remember that during these hundreds and hundreds of years, these people had no temporal power. Therefore, whatever they did was a speculative work within themselves. There were not let's fall. Uh, they were wanderers, they were not even citizens, they had no temporal rights, and they were pursued from one country to another. But even in this scattering of the, of the tribes, uh, the concept of a great government based upon the primary radiations of the general energy, or at least this concept is already growing and developing within. Now the next phase of their work is what this thing turns 
ceremonial Kabbalah. And the ceremonial Kabbalah, Kabbalah deals primarily with the ritual of religion. And the uh, concept of the, of the Torah these were formalities set by the priesthood according to the law of Moses. These forms could not be buried and documentable. They had to be preserved exactly as form, as symbols and ceremonies. For to depart from the form of the symbol was to betray Israel with the ancient law, but no man knew why. Your Kabbalah took hold of this problem with a very simple and direct statement that all of these rituals and symbols had a meaning, and that it was the meaning and not the form that it was intended to perpetuate. Therefore, the formality was only a reminder of the meaning, even as words are only reminders of the ideas which are held within them. Therefore, that real and true religion had nothing to do with the physical formulas, except that these formulas were mysteriously symbols of something that was alive. The rituals and formulas were not themselves visibly and physically alive, but they concealed a living essence. They concealed a great power to the uh, one who understood that. And this power was held in the concept of the ceremonial Kabbalah. The purpose of this Kabbalah being simply the illumination of the truth seeker, uh, the attainment of identification with this great pattern of realities. Now we have ways of looking at these things, and the old Jewish writers uh, have thought about them themselves. Now you have, as we have pointed out before, a very interesting situation in Jewish philosophy that we do not have in any other situation of its kind. The Jewish religion is probably the most completely collectivistic faith that there is. And as I have uh, mentioned in a previous lecture, the statement of the substance of it is as follows. There is no salvation for the Jew. There is salvation only for Israel. Now this is a very, very important thing. In the Jewish mind, the salvation of self, apart from the rest, has very little attraction. And well, now, in modern times, there is some breaking away from this. But in the old day, uh, there was this tremendous bond between the individual and the group. Now, back in the days when the Kabbalah was being formed and fashioned, this concept was strong. And when we say, therefore, that the purpose of the ceremonial of religious Kabbalah was illumination, we know completely and definitely that the old scholar did not imply, or wish to have it imply, that this illumination was something selfishly for himself. Because his entire structure of faith made this impossible. Illumination for him, therefore, could only be like salvation for himself. It could only mean the preservation or salvation or the illumination of his will. It could not mean himself as a person. Anything that happened to him, any light that came into his life, any spiritual content that was awakened in his soul, was awakened not for his use, not for his benefit, but for the good of Israel. And in reading back over the writings of the great rabbis over the many hundreds of years, this is an inflexible rule. Namely, that the truly religious person seeking to improve in any way in virtue, in grace, in wisdom, in understanding, can have no motive other than the enlightenment of Israel. None of these things can do him any good because there is no salvation for him apart from the salvation of Israel. Therefore, his works must be always for the common good, or through the common good to ensure his own salvation. This is a 
complete reversal of many popular attitudes. Many have taken the attitude that if they took care of themselves first, then they could in future help others. Or they feel that by their own enlightenment, uh, they can achieve certain useful ends. Also, they believe that if the state becomes wise, it will save the people. This is not the viewpoint of the old state. His statement was that there is only one salvation, and that is the salvation of the whole. That the whole is first, not last. And that the individual is part of the totality. And this was based upon his own basic concept of God. Because in the deeper mysteries of God, deity, as I'm so here, was this absolute totality. During the ceremonial religions of these people, there is this definite limit of searching for light, searching for inner understanding, that all is for Israel. All this that the Jew may understand Israel. One of the old rabbis said in one of his works, it is of no importance whether we are understood or not. All things are measured by what we understand. We may be misjudged by a thousand. This means nothing. But if we misjudge one, it is a disaster. That is the point. So in this concept of totality, we find the rise of that ceremonial. And we also find uh, the to their concept of Israel, which obviously, as we find in the Kabbalah, in its mysterious form, when all the parts of the universe are fitted together, when all the numbers are added together, when all things have been a time, a time, and a half time brought into the pattern. Out of all the words, out of all the 72 names of the great deity, out of the seventy-two powers of the archangel, out of the great name, Shemham Farash, comes, out of all these coming together into one pattern, raises the single word, Israel. It is the totality of the totality. It does not relate primarily to people at all. But for those who saw us in the veil, it was enough for Israel to symbolize the world. Now this caused the old Jew also to come to the conclusion that in some mysterious way within his own faith, but this is a highly controversial issue, but I think we must be fair to it. And that is that in some way he felt back through those times that in something, if Israel could be true, and we find this in his writings, if Israel can be true to Israel, <coughs> The whole world of the Gentile is redeemed. In other words, in one of the old rabbinical commentaries, it says that God created many peoples. And that if one people kept the law, God would forgive the rest in their name. And it is a curious thing that this recurs so frequently in the study of the ceremony of God. There are another phase of the matter which I think also has to be considered. And that is that in the times of the ancient Jews, sciences were not as far evolved as they are now. We do not have a great deal of record in the outward working of things concerning the scientific knowledge of that period among those people. Because they were more or less isolated from the great centers of learning. And they were more or less wound up and not locked into their own way of life. But through the Kabbalah, we see that a great scientific concept was forming among these people. We can trace it without a break for over 2,000 years. And we know from the condition in which we find it that it could have not have reached that condition except by a great deal of early immaturity. So it appears that, again, the prophets, those who walked with God and who received the anointing of oil after the order of Melchizedek were in some ways intuitively aware 
are inspirationally pointless a great principle of science and mathematics of our music, literature, and other subjects that we do not know how many today. So we have among them the rudiments of the great sciences of cosmogony and the beginnings of the concepts of anthropology. Uh, the, the concept of cosmogony is a magnificent expansion in many directions and dimensions of space around the flame of the opening chapters of Genesis. But whereas this appears to be almost merely an outline to refresh the memory, the commentaries and the work of the old Kabbalists expands their researches into this subject into thousands of times the length of the original. And in this concept, we find a number of things uh, for which the greatest authenticity and antiquity uh, is allotted. And we have no reason to doubt it because the words do occur, although in sometimes without a very clear translation in the more familiar writings. But the words are there. And these words have to do uh, as the Kabbalah tells us, with the, the dawn of things, the formation of things from their own roots. Uh, very little is available other than Noah von Rosenroth's Kabbalah de Nodata uh, to give us a clue to these concepts. In the uh, years past, in working, working with this subject, I have had the privilege of discussing it with several uh, learned European rabbis. Uh, the rabbis in this country are certainly mostly not in a position to put it much. You have to go to the old rabbinical groups that have flourished or survived or struggled through in areas like Czechoslovakia or Poland or one of these areas in which in their desperate defense they have held very tightly to all of the things with which they believed and knew. I was talking to one old rabbi whose father before him had been a rabbi, and whose father before him had been a great priest of the faith in Europe. And he told me that he had seen in his grandfather's library, when he was a very small boy, he couldn't remember much anymore, he had seen priceless scrolls that had belonged in the family for centuries. He said that some of these scrolls made a part of the Catholic put together were more than a foot and a half wide and over 200 feet in length. Every part of their surfaces had been neutrally covered with diagrams, with figures, <coughs> and symbols. All of these symbols connected from the beginning to the end with a thread through them like a thread through a string of beads. But these diagrams had been studied by a few older rabbis, but the younger ones were afraid of them, believing that they might be works of the devil. But these ancient manuscripts, Lord knows whether they have survived the struggles in Poland and Czechoslovakia and Germany in the last 20 years, we do not know. But these old manuscripts and records did exist. And they were records that represented a, a very careful and thoughtful <coughs> development. Uh, as one of the older manuscripts says at the beginning, this is the writing about the root of things. And the fact it grows from the root. And that which bears witness from the growth, and that which bears fruit from the witness. I remember that old statement at the beginning of one of the manuscripts. These things are very interesting, and I think we cannot hope to go into them this evening in anything resembling an ordinary way, but I do believe that they can fit it one thing for us, and that is a certain thoughtfulness. I think they will make us perhaps a little more considerate, a little more gentle, a little more observing, a little more inclined uh, to think about the possibilities of these secrets locked with the silver key. Because they are part of the religion of the justify the adaptation. Now, in this uh, problem of the Kabbalah, we know that the original concept began uh, always with one point, and this point was called Ain. 
A I N or A Y N. Now the word itself, the wonderful word, uh, because it says when you break it down, it's something like this: I am a word. And the I am the word that can never be a word. When you see me, you see nothing. And I am only a word because through, the, through this word, or through this thought, you shall become aware that I am not a word. In other words, this word is said to be the only word in the world which by its own substance and nature eliminates itself. When you see this word, you have seen that which has no boundary, no dimension, no beginning, no end, no middle, which has neither substance nor essence, which has neither name nor sound. Therefore, the letters themselves consist of a series of statements negating themselves. The more you study the word, the more fascinating it becomes. You could write an essay on it, on the three little letters. And most the rabbinical scholars know very little about it. But uh, a few who have been in the old school can do wonderful things with that word. They can combine its letters in many ways. They can make the very letters apart and put them together in other patterns. But no matter what you do with them, the word always extinguishes itself. It always ends up by saying, Thou shalt make no likeness of me in this world or in the world to come. Thou shalt make no graven image upon paper, upon stone, upon anything else. So well, this word is the word that contradicts itself, that wipes itself out. And in common parlance, it has been called the boundless. It combines the boundless, the nameless, the soundless. It is the hymn of everlasting that rises up, saying, If I name thee, I deny thee. So the word may be known or experienced only in the silence. It is the name which vanishes away when it is drawn there in reality. And the old scholar, the old Jewish rabbi said to his disciple, my son, the hardest thing you will ever have to do is to rub out that one word. You can take away all other words and that one will remain. If you take that one away, you have attained the salvation of Israel. So these meditations and musings are something that we don't talk about much. I don't know very many students of all of know anything about. And uh, I will wager you won't find this in books. But from A, which is the word that you have taken away, comes insult. Now, an insult is a combination of a word which must be removed and another word which can be allowed to name. The word soap is derived from our same root as our word Sophia and means wisdom. Enso means the wisdom that cannot be possessed. The wisdom that even God does not have. Because uh, strangely enough, God is the only being that does do it. Because being perfect, he does not need wisdom, because wisdom is an attitude. In the Kabbalah, therefore, Enzo tells us a very interesting story. Aim being again, the word to be 
taken away you leave wisdom and wisdom is combined with this word to form a new term and in the forming of this new term the insult we have a strange contradiction the contradiction of wisdom and that which cannot be or can never exist. This structure here carries on to produce a third term, unfair, for which means uh, the breath or the light or the light of wisdom. And these three are together one term, on the a triad. And when the triad is put together in the form of an equilateral triangle, a great number of words can be fashioned out of it by reading, beginning with one letter or word and passing to the next at different points of the triangle. Out of all these words comes the Kabbalistic concept, as they express it, of eternity. And to them, eternity is the complete statement of things which is not there, plus supernaya, which are theirness and the revelation of theirness. And these three are the Sefa and Yasira, the Sefa and Zohar, and the Sefa Apocalypse, or the three great revelations. And these revelations con concern and relate to uh, the root to which is unknown. Now from this root in the Kabbalah, there are four what are called, first of all, the Sephira. And these Sephira are the inverted plant with its root in cause and its branches and flowers in effect. <coughs> There are two trees, one growing downward from reality and the other growing upward from the heart of man. Then he describes this class as the tree of the soul which is planted in the heart and grows into the great palm tree of salvation. And in the Kabbalah, these two trees are due to the fact that there was a seed of the tree of life planted in the great land and it took upon itself his life, and his life grew into the tree. And the two trees of the Sephiroth meet in a strange and mysterious way and intermingle their branches by the 49 paths that tie together the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. And the trees expand. And I have seen these trees expanded to their 12th fold. This is an incredible amount of detail. It means uh, that thousands of of these trees, each one marked and labeled and signifying its relationship both to the tree which grows from the root and the tree which grows from Adam. And what part of this tree overlaps the other? And one who corresponds to the individual concept of inborns and to the other the orange. One is the tree of life in the, in the sense of the tree of the unfolding of the nameless. And the other is the tree of salvation, which is the redemption or regeneration of man. These trees are so detailed and the descriptions in them are so complicated that it's doubtful if one Jewish scholar in ten thousand can understand it. Because no longer do the old scholars read the words that their ancestors did. They gloss over it today that a couple of years of Hebrew their theological sentence. So as we say, this is all key also to two other things. As Rabbi Maimonides pointed out, the whole purpose of the Kabbalah is to fulfill the Torah to build an absolute foundation of justification from the law. To make it obvious, the law is the final proof of wisdom. Not the wisdom of man, but the wisdom of Israel. 
And secondly, it is the purpose, the second purpose of this great study is to show how, in this process of things, the salvation of Israel is to be assured. In other words, it is the consummation of the work in the prophetic course. Now, as I have explained to you, this is only an outline, a very rough line, and not a particularly, uh, perhaps, intelligible line. But before we bring the evening to a close, and we're going to have to uh, soon now, I just want to show you a little example or a sample of how these things work, uh, work uh, in the ancient uh, Jewish records. And so I have here an our manuscript from our collection a part of the development of the Sefer HaZohar. And uh, this is only a fragment. Uh, but uh, a Jewish scientist to whom I showed it some time ago was very much interested in the study of certain parts of it because he said that uh, part of this diagram relates to a physical problem which has plagued science for quite a long time and that the answer to the problem is obviously here. And that has to do with the resistance of motion against the continuum of space. And, uh, I know that this manuscript was written long before those words were very significant in modern science. Uh, the um, manuscript which we have here, I do not, I cannot give you as complete a history of it as I would like to. Because like many of these things, it uh, passes through many hands and disappears. I'll tell you how I found it. Uh, I was at the British Museum one day. I didn't find it there, by the way. <laughs> on an angle street leading into the front of the museum. And in the window, there was a small reproduction in plaster of the head of the Queen Nefertiti of Egypt. And I was a little intrigued, so I went in. I asked him if he had any old books. He said he didn't think so, but there were a few things in the basement that he hadn't looked at for a number of years. So we took the floor off up and went down the ladder into the basement. And in one corner of the basement, wrapped up in newspapers, was just a withdrawal. I suspect from the structure of it uh, that it is probably Polish and that its history, its date, probably 300 to 350 years old. This is reasonably old for this title. Uh, for a formal and technical credit, it is evidently from the same school as the uh, translation to Knorr and Rosenbach in his work on the Kabbalah Dei Data. This is not a complete work. This is one scroll. And this particular scroll is concerned primarily uh, with the Abbas Elohim, which means the mystery of the 50 breaths of God. In other words, the mystery of the breathing of the creating God. And that with each of these breathings is orders of life energized. And this manuscript deals with which orders of life are energized by what breathings. And also with the mysterious new breathings by means of which uh, the age or the formal name for these beings is breathed in and dissolved. So the work also contains the fact that we outbreathe the symbols of things, and in our inbreathing we remove the symbol or dissolve it again. And the symbol passes through our hearts, and there it ceases as the blood is purified. It is, a, it is an amazing document, but it will give you some concept of the way in which these things were worked out. Now this is all written upon parchment that has been specially prepared the pieces are fastened together with thin strips of parchment because no thread, string, or cord is permitted according to the law or the Torah. And these manuscripts unfold the mystery of the universe. And here is part of the development of the aim and the aim soft and its extension through the first three spheres. 
which are the spheres of uh, Abba, Ema, and Dea. And of all the mysteries of the Kabbalah, one of the greatest mysteries is Dea, which is not, however, a synonym of death, as you might have first think. Because Dea is the first manifestation of angels in the field of creation. Because Dea is the being that is no being on the level of creation. That which is, but is not. That which exists, but cannot be named. And that from which all named things flow to form the nameless. And this principle of there, as it appears in the Kabbalah, is set always here in the form of a cross. So here are the paths of the letters, the 49 gates through which Moses passed, and through which also Solomon passed but where he was forced to stand and wait for the Messiah who would pass through the 50th gate. So this will give you a little idea of how these philosophies were developed. And here is a legitimate example. And we hope, it's a serious hope of ours, that one of these days we will be able to translate and publish the entire scroll with its commentaries from the Kabbalah de Nodata. Because I think it would give us something that would help us a lot. Perhaps it wouldn't all answer all the questions of the universe. Perhaps it wouldn't make us eternally wise. Perhaps it would, however, give us a little bit of better understanding of the people that has wandered far along, that's gone through this very strange and terrible thing, and has developed a great many pressures as a result of the experiences of the past. Perhaps an understanding of these things will advance the brotherhood of peoples by helping us to realize that in the secret doctrine of Israel we have a very great and noble concept and that it might be a wonderful thing if more Jewish people understood it better and found thereby not only a true key to their own religion but a greater and deeper understanding which would enable them to find and experience the love of Israel among all men and among all people under the sun. I think this heritage would be important to be known. And uh, in that, I am not differing very much from the late Professor Einstein, who on one occasion said that one of the most important things you can do to ever do is to understand the Kabbalah. But in that, you will not only find a great knowledge, but most of all, you would find the center of his religion, the secret book, and that is the book of the great peace, which would put his heart to rest. And so that's all for the people.